Can I do a little bit of 50 cents or two bar, whatever? Um, okay, so. I'll be slim shady. Okay. Well, I'll be. Um, is that my name slim shady? I'm slim shady, you're Dr. Dre. I'm Dr. Dre. We talked about it. We did. Definitely. She's doing the boom chuk chuk all the way. Okay, so um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Um, we have the great honour tonight of speaking with the Queen of Crime, the great Martina Cole. Okay, so um, the evening's going to pan out like this. The first part of the evening is um, Martina's going to chat um, about her life, her writing, and um, her. Well, the work she also does aside from that I'm interested in. Um, and then we're going to open it up to the floor. There's going to be a question and answer session from everybody. And then the books are on sale over here, The Life, the new novel. So Martine is going to be signing copies of the novel. And then if we get drunk enough, we will wrap. <laughs> okay, so... I think she will. I'm <laughs> uh, on water. Uh, so my first question to Martine is, uh, what was the first book as a young girl that ever... You just fell in love with and you couldn't put down. I think you know, sort of I grew up on fluff and nip and everything, you know, I'm in my fifties, but I think for me the first I always loved reading, you know, I always wanted to read and we had a really great nun at Holy Cross and she knew how much I loved books and she was reading all these books for me, which I didn't understand then, but sort of I read again as I got older. But I was always a very prolific reader. I used to go to all the jungle sales, I used to play truant from school. And I said, all the jumble sales, you know, and go and buy all the books. And I was about 10 and I bought um, Catherine Cookson's Round Tower. Do you remember that? And it had a big sticker on it saying, winner of the Winifred Holby Award. I thought, oh, that must be good. So I paid two pence for that then. And it was very melodramatic. And, and I just fell in love with the whole melodrama. Because I love all the old films, like Mildred Pierce, no old no, romantic films, all of that. And then I got a AJ Cronin's Hatter's Castle. I think I paid five p for the hardback. And I fell in love with AJ Cronin. And I just love the books that are, you know, very melodramatic. And I think my book's quite melodramatic. But I love the whole concept of big, powerful stories that knock you off your feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, those books knocked me off my feet, and I think that's where I got the love of dramatic books and, mm -hmm. and wanted to write books. And when I was really, really young, and don't, I hope Jackie Collins only in the city, but when I was at school, I saw a, a documentary on Jackie Collins, and she had a walk-in wardrobe. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it, bigger than my bedroom. So I thought, oh, I want to be a writer. I want a great big old walking walk. <laughs> that, that helped as well. That reminds me of Dolly Parton. I want to be yeah. like Trash Mama. Yeah, <laughs> and she's the little. I love her. Do you remember when she was on um, Wogan and he said, How, you know, you look so. She said, It takes a lot of money to look this cheap. <laughs> <laughs> she's yeah. um, uh, Another, another um, thing that I wanted to ask you was about your first novel. Like, this just sounds like a fairy tale way of being published to me. Well, at the time, I mean, it sounds like it now, but yeah. I wrote Band of when I was 21. Um, and I just really loved it. I used to write all the time. And I wrote I wrote Band of and it was set in the 70s then, in the early 80s. And I put it in the cupboard, and then I wrote other books and scripts. I wrote plays and all sorts. I would never ever let anybody read them. And then I was coming up 30 and I was, I, I was working in a nursing agency of all things and I, I, I became sort of very, very big in this nursing agency and I ended up running it. And then one of the girls wanted to leave and she said to me, would you like to, you know, buy us a partner? And it was £25,000, which was a lot of money in the late 80s. I mean, it's a lot of money now, but it was a lot of money then. And I went to the bank and, you know, got the loan and thing. And I was moving at the same time. Mm. And I had this big cupboard full of manuscripts and everything. And I had a glass of wine and a cigarette, as usual. And I pulled out Dangerous Lady and I sat on the floor in like, the spare bedroom and I started reading it. For the first time ever, I read my own work and thought, that's not bad, you know, that isn't too bad. And I got, oh, you know, like that writing bug come back again. 
And I went into work the next day and I said, look, can I have a six month sabbatical? And they went, what for? I said, I want to write a book. Well, they were rolling round the floor. They go, like, you're going to write a book. I went, yeah, I am. And that made me a bit more determined. And the funny thing was, when I got published, they were going, we knew. <laughs> I said, well, you didn't look like you knew you were rolling around the floor laughing at me. But I just had this real, 30 was a really big watershed for me. 40 didn't bother me that much. I'm not even going to say that for about 50. But 30 was my watershed. And I knew that if I didn't try and get published then, I never ever would. And it would have just been one of those things that you put so much time and effort into and you never saw it through to the end. So I gave myself the year, I rewrote Dangerous Lady and, you know, I was very lucky I got published. Yeah, incredibly talented as well. I mean, well, I, don't think every, I, mean I, was, I was feeling up in the petrol station and one of the women said, you know, I saw her on Twitter and to you, Martin Cole, and I was like, yeah, she said, that woman can tell a story. Yeah, well, I don't think you'll do it too bad yourself. <laughs> Um, well, I did a Sunday paper with Danny Boyle who loves you, he's never said nothing to me. <laughs> but I think it's hard, I think, I think the hardest thing about writing, I think you would understand this, is when you write a book, you do it all on your own. Mm. You're months and months and months and you live with a whole family and a whole load of people and they become really real to you. And then suddenly, everybody has to like them. And suddenly, all the time you spent alone, suddenly, all of a sudden, Hundreds of thousands of people have access to what you've done, and it's really nerve wracking. Mm. It's very, very nerve wracking. It is. And it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm on that, my 19th book, and I still get that nervousness. I still feel sick the week before it comes out. And, and I think if you ever lose that, I think you should, you should stop writing mm. or acting or whatever you do. Mm. That's incredible, mm. absolutely incredible. 19 books. I never thought I'd get past one. And I remember that when I first got published, I remember going in the shop in W.H. Smith, and there I was with Catherine Cookson, G.H. Cooper, all the C's. And I thought, God, why didn't I change my name? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I took it up the end of Exeville in Holland, and I had to look at it. I kept thinking, why didn't I change my name? Every big author begins with C. But actually, I think it done me some good tricks. I think while they were looking for the other books, they found mine. Um, I just, I'm just really intrigued about um, you know your writing process. I know a lot of these students are here tonight, and um, we we are sort of in the middle of writing novels and as a class, and they're interested in like how you come up with your plots, how you come up with your characters, and um, process really. You know, but for me personally, I mean, I write, I write through the night. I write when it's really, really, really quiet. Um, and I worked night shifts for a long time, I was nursing, and I, I quite like the night. And my house is like Casey's court during the day. You never know, it's always someone turning up, phones ringing. So the night was always the best time for me to write, and I quite like writing. And I don't sleep that I've never been a great sleeper. No. I'm a bit like Margaret Fat. I remember one truly, Margaret Fat just slept three hours a night. I thought, oh my god, that's me. And she drank whiskey, and I thought, oh my god, that's me. I said to myself, if I can get a blue ring, shoot me. <laughs> I do, I'm, I'm terrible for through the night. I love writing through the night. And you know, years ago, I used to, I used to hear the milkman come, and you'd hear the bottles and hear it, you know. And now I hear because I've got chickens now. So when my chickens start cockadoodle doing, do it, I know it's time to wind down. But I find the nights the best for me because I tell you something about two o'clock in the morning. There's no one about. It's so quiet, the world feels different. Yeah. And you can sort of, for me personally, I feel that's my best time, my most creative time. Mm. Because there's nothing else, and you feel like you're on your own, and you can lose yourself in what you're doing. And so, I don't, my first ever writers' conference was a really famous writer, I won't say who, a really lovely lady, and I'd gone after her. And she went, Sometimes I only write two words in a day. So they are important words for my book. I think, you know, my God, I can do a chapter in my two people. I thought, I know I'm going to write that, I'll be quantity over quality. But I really respected that she got up at five in the morning. But I got to bed at five o'clock in the morning. I thought, oh my God, I couldn't imagine getting up working from five to seven. I couldn't imagine having, I just haven't got that kind of, I don't know, 
to say, right, I'm going to get up at four and have my breakfast and write from five to seven every day. I couldn't, I don't think I, I could have that kind of regime. I mean, I might start at nine at night, ten at night, eleven at night, one in the morning. But once I start, I'm there. And I always say, if you've got a blank screen and you look at the screen or you've got a blank piece of paper, start writing something else. Don't concentrate on what you should be writing. Start something else, because you'll always have another book to write. There's always going to be something else to write, and sometimes it just doesn't work with what you're working on. Yeah, I liked your quote as well. You know, the things that you said to the younger people you work with in prison, you know, mm. you said you've got one thing that um, all writers want, and that's time. Yeah. Uh, make it. They always <laughs> sit there for the I was doing 20 years. But, I say, but, you've got something. All writers want time on your own. Yeah, but make it mean something you said to me. Yeah, make it, make it, you know. I know I do a lot of prison workshops, I think, and people say, oh, her in a prison, but, you know, I think that you have to put people in prison, you know, that's how it should work and it's our society, but I believe we should send them out a better person than the person that went in. Mm. Especially now with such big sentences for drugs and, you know, and everything else, you know, if someone's doing 30 years or, 20 years and they're only in their 20s. Why not come out with a degree? You know, do something. And you know, the thing that saddens me most in the women's prisons and the men's is that 90% of them can hardly read or write. And they come and do my writing class, and then a lot of them will go on and do basic literacy. I think, I think that's a terrible indictment of the country as it is. We've got the best education system in the world and it's free. And people still are leaving school without any kind of real education. I think that's really shocking. So mm -hmm. I always argue with my say to them, get off your arse, if you excuse my French, and get yourself and learn something, do something, read. I think you're absolutely right. I've worked within the system and I've taught primary school and um, I've worked in emotional behavioural difficulties. And, um, Institutions, and I've seen how much the system has been. Well, the system's institutionalised. I mean, I'd, sometimes you see people have been in there so long, you know, they're never going to last on yeah. the outside because they, they won't be able to last on the outside. Mm -hmm. And it's always lovely, especially when you see places like Brixton and Wandsworth, and come up Christmas, all the tramps and that go out and have a rob up because they can have a nice Christmas. <laughs> and so, I say, what would you do? And I say, oh, it's lovely tea, you know, we've got a can of beer, we've got a nice roast tea, you know. And you know, but for them, it's a, it's a nice cup of tea. For us, it's the biggest nightmare we could imagine. But and I think that's a very sad, sad thing. You know, I mean, sometimes, because we do stuff with a passage, in, you know, with Father Michael Seed and that. A lot of those people who go to Centre Point and everything in London are really educated people. But life, you know, I'm a great believer. My dad always said, life is a series of kicks in the teeth. You just have to enjoy the bits in between, you know. I think there's... I mean, I met a lady today who had the most terrible life. I think some people... I think fate's very cruel. It can be very cruel to some people, you know. And you have to say to yourself there, but for the grace of God, it could be any of us. You know, in America, most people in New York are two paychecks away from the street. Don't you think that's very scary? And that's happening here now. And you have whole families living in cars. Because they don't allow in, in America like we do here to help families. If you're thrown out your apartment, they say, we'll live in your car. And people live in their car with their children. You know, I mean, it's a very scary thought, isn't it? And some of the people you see on the street, they do your high-powered jobs, but, you know, things happen to them. And 